right. All right. Today we're going to discuss the Paraduma, the red heifer. The reason why we're going to discuss the red heifer today is because this Shabbos, in addition to being Shabbos Parshas Shemini, we read a special Haftorah called um, it's all it's called Shabbos Parshas Porto. We read a special Maftir about the red heifer. And the Haftorah is likewise on the subject connected with the red heifer. Now, just a little bit of a background over here. Where does this whole idea of Maftir and Haftorah come from? We know that we have a Torah portion every single week. So where does the idea, where does the, idea of the, the Maftir and the Haftorah come from? So there was a point in history when Jews in Israel were under oppression by a foreign power. And there was an edict that all Jews were forbidden from reading the Torah. In such a situation, the reading of the Torah in public on Shabbos from the Torah scroll became unavailable to the Jewish people, to the congregations. For it was forbidden and it would have caused a disaster and put the Jews in grave danger. So they could no longer read from the Torah scrolls on Shabbos. So in response to this terrible edict, the sages selected from the prophets different sections and chapters that mirrored, that were on the subject of what would have been the, that week's Torah portion. And that they were able to read. Sections from the prophets they were able to read. So instead of reading from the Torah portion every week, there was a period of time when Jews only read a section of the Novi, of the prophets of the scriptures, and that was called the Haftorah. That's where the Haftorah was introduced to the Jewish people. It wasn't at post-Torah reading. It was instead of, in place of the Torah reading, but on the same subject of the Torah reading. Yes, Baruch David? It seems uh, uh, strange that an outside source would differentiate between reading from one holy book and another. But that was the reality. Outside source. Say, you can't read anything. That was then, it, this is very legal and very technical. You can't read from the Torah, but you can read from any other any other that, of the books. That, that, was, that was the thing. It wasn't, it was, it was specifically against the reading of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. Now, this ban, after it was lifted, after this um, ban on reading Torah was lifted, so the Jewish people returned back to reading the weekly Torah portion. That's what happened. However, they didn't want to make it appear that reading from the prophets is equal to reading from the Torah. So what they did was like this. They wanted to, they wanted to keep this custom going of reading from the prophets. They didn't want to abolish this idea completely, that which was already started. But at the same time, they didn't want to make it as if this a new custom was on par with the reading of the Torah. So therefore, they said like this, read the Torah portion of the week. And following the Torah portion of the week, you will read that section from the prophets called the Haftorah. Who's going to read the section of the prophets called the Haftorah? So they would call up the last person. They would make a new aliyah called Maftir. And this Maftir aliyah would be the one they would call up. They would read the final couple of verses from the Torah portion. And then that person who was standing up there anyways on the bima, they would then go and read the section of the prophets. So that's where today's modern day Torah reading service of Torah portion, maftir, and half Torah originated from, which is why to be called up to maftir, one does not need to be a bar mitzvah. Even a minor, a child could be called up to maftir because it wasn't really an aliyah. It was an added thing that came much later. So reading from the maftir or the prophets was not something that took on all of the laws and the stringencies of reading from the actual Torah portion. So this Shabbos, we read a section 
for the Maftir, from the Book of Numbers, Parshas Chukas, which introduces for us the idea, the laws of the red heifer. What is the background to this law? So we know there's something called ritual impurity. What is the highest level of ritual impurity? That is the corpse, the dead body. If someone comes in contact with a corpse, if you come too close to a corpse, or if you're under the same roof as a corpse, you contract that ritual impurity from that corpse. In today's day and age, we're all ritually impure. And it's for this reason, when Mashiach comes, we will all need to go through a purification process in order to serve in the temple, in order to eat from the temple sacrifices, in order to enter, enter into certain parts of the temple. What is the purification process? So the purification process is an eight-day process. The eight-day process is as follows. On the third day and on the seventh day, the person seeking purification would need to be sprinkled with a mixture of ashes and water. What type of ashes and water? So this ash had to come from a red heifer. They had to find a red heifer, which was very specific and detailed, exactly what was a suitable candidate to be a red heifer. It couldn't have even two white hairs. It could not have a yoke placed on it. And many, many laws. But if they found the suitable red heifer, they would take that red heifer and they would then go ahead and slaughter it on a mountain near the Temple Mount. It wasn't done on the Temple Mount in the temple. It was done on a different mountain near the Temple Mount. And then its carcass would be burned to ashes. And then those ashes would be mixed with water. And some of that mixture of ash and water would then be sprinkled on the, the person seeking purification on the third and on the seventh day. After that, they would wait, they would go to the mikvah, and then they would be the next day, they would become pure. So why did we read it this week? Why are we reading the section of the red heifer this Shabbos? What's the connection between today, this Shabbos, and the red heifer? So Rashi in Tractate Megillah teaches us that this portion is read to remind the Jewish people to purify themselves so that they can bring the Pesach, the Paschal offering in a state of ritual purity. Because we have the holiday of Pesach just around the corner, and in order to fulfill the obligation of bringing a carbon Pesach, a Paschal lamb, you have to be in a state of ritual purity. And now we learned it takes eight days to be ritually pure, so if you came in contact with a dead body, Torah wants us to remember these laws that, hey, you have a couple of weeks in front of you. So if you're impure, start your purification process. And if you're pure, basically, we're telling the person, be careful, lest you become impure and unable to perform and partake in the Pesach offering. Now, why was this important? Because Jews, every Jew who lived in Jerusalem, if you were in Jerusalem at the time, you had to partake in a carbon Pesach. So why do we read it today? Although we're not in a state where we, well, maybe hopefully this year we will be. But for the last 2,000 years, we were not in a position to be able to bring the carbon Pesach. Nevertheless, we still read this section of Maftir, this section is Parshas Parah, the section that discusses this ritual purification. We read it to remember what used to be. This is what used to be. On one level, on a deeper level, we read it in an anticipation of what's going to be, not what was, but what's going to be this upcoming year. We're not looking backward, but we're looking ahead. Looking at in three weeks from now is Pesach, and we're going to need to bring a carbon Pesach, so we have to know these laws. So we're highlighting these laws in anticipation for the immediate arrival of Moshiach. But here's where we have a little bit of a question. 
And that is as follows. And Maimonides, Maimonides teaches us in Mitzvah 113, in the Sefer HaMitzvah, he says like this, the commandment that God commanded us to, to make this mixture of the red heifer ashes, <coughs> this is an order that there should be ashes and this mixture available to anyone who needs it. To purify themselves from the impurification of the dead corpse. Omar, as the verse says, that it should be preserved for the congregation of the Jewish people. Which means that part of this mitzvah of the red heifer is that there always must be enough ash mixture in the reserves for the entire Jewish people. Lest we need it for everyone to become ritually purified, there has to be this mixture in reserves. Which begs the question, why? Why do we need to have such a large amount in the reserves? Because the truth of the matter is, there was a very small amount of the population who would require ritual purification at any, at any given time. True, when Mashiach comes, we're all going to need it, as I said earlier. But up until Mashiach comes, and 2,000 years ago, when the temple stood, and these laws were relevant in our past, there was never a time when all Jews needed it. it, was, it w- such a situation wouldn't really occur. And we're going to understand now how this was so. How narrow, really, this purification process really was. So let's begin when it comes to when it comes to the Mishnah in Chagiga, the first Mishnah in Tractate Chagiga, which discusses making going up to Jerusalem and making the pilgrimage to the temple for Pesach. So your initial thought is that everyone is obligated, but the truth is not everyone is obligated. The Mishnah says like this: Hakol Chayovim Bereiyah. All are obligated to make the pilgrimage in Jerusalem during the Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot festivals. Chut, except for. So it's everyone except for. And now we start listing the list. Mechedesh, the first one who is not obligated to participate in this mitzvah is the Chedesh. The Chedesh is the one who is a deaf mute. The second one is the shaita. The shaita is the mentally incompetent. The third one is the cotton, a minor, someone who's not yet bar mitzvah. The next one is the tumtum. Tumtum is someone whose gender is unknown because their genitalia is hidden. The next case is the next the next person who's exempt is van der Eugenis. The Andragonist is the person who has both genders. He has, the gen- or she, he has the genitalia of both male and female. The next one is Vinashim, all women, Vavodim, and all slaves, Sheena Mishochrodim, who are not free. The next one who's exempt is Hachiger, someone who is lame. The next one is Vasumo, someone who is blind. And one who is sick, and one who is old, and anyone who is unable to walk on his legs to ascend the mountain to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount. So you have a bunch of exceptions over here. You have children, you have elderly, you have deaf, blind, lame, ill. And then the biggest exemption of all is, of course, the women. Once you say that all women are exempt, you're immediately knocked off half of the population. Half of the 50% of the Jewish people are exempt. Now, in addition to that 50%, you have all children. You got to figure children are another big chunk of the percentage. Young, 10% we'll call it, at least probably 20% is younger than bar mitzvah. 
probably figure 20% of the, of, of the population. Then you have blind, sick, old. I mean, you're talking about an overwhelming majority or close to a super majority of people who are exempt from this mitzvah. Now, why are women exempt from this mitzvah? Because women are exempt from all mitzvahs, which are hazman groma. Hazman groma means they're time-bound mitzvahs. Any mitzvah which has to be done at a specific time, women are exempt. It's very simple. If a child, obviously a child is exempt from the mitzvah of going up to Jerusalem. They're a child. They can't go on their own. So they can't, they can't be partake in the karma. So if the woman is obligated to go, the child has to stay home. So what happens now? Who's going to watch the baby? Who's going to stay home with the child? The father goes to Jerusalem. It's a big trip. It's not like today you get into a car, you hop into a car and you're there. It wasn't like that. It was a whole long journey to go there. Talking about days, weeks till somebody came back home. When they left, till they came back home. Who's going to be with the children? So it's impossible to obligate the mother to have to leave her children or to schlep them, to have to make them schlep them along when they're when they're tiny, tiny children or even older. It could be too hard. So therefore, it's in a it's a mitzvah which is understood why they do not have to participate. Moreover, this particular mitzvah, only Jews who lived in Israel were obligated to make the pilgrimage. Now, during the first temple, most Jews lived in Israel, so it was it was applicable to most Jews. But during the during this the era of the second temple. Most Jews lived in the diaspora. So any Jew who's living in the diaspora was not obligated to go make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the three festivals. So you're talking about you're reducing the number even more, especially in the second temple. So the question is, why are we taking up so much time of the congregation? And in Jewish law, there's something called kovoid hatzibur, which is the honor of the congregation. There's also something called tirchot detzibur, which is the burden of the congregation. And we are very, very careful. Our rabbis were extremely careful not to burden the congregation with anything that's unnecessary. To show honor and respect for their time is priority. And therefore, before you do something in public, you have to ask yourself, is this something that is suitable for and appropriate for this congregation? Does it bring them honor or are they uninterested? For example, I'll give you a simple example. If possible, when we take out a Torah scroll, the Torah scroll should be pre-rolled to the place where it's supposed to be written, where it's supposed to be read from. Why? Because if you open up the scroll and you have to start rolling the scroll, like what's, what's everybody doing while you're rolling the scroll? They're twiddling their thumbs. That you're wasting everybody's time. So therefore, it's inappropriate. Now, sometimes it's necessary because you only have one Torah and you have to use, read, read two portions. But if possible... This should be done beforehand. If you have more than one Torah, it be done before. And why? Give respect to the people. So why are we reading the portion about the, the, the red heifer today, this Shabbos, if it's not applicable to most Jews? Most Jews living in the diaspora is not relevant to us because we're, we, we don't have to bring this carbon. We didn't have to bring it for years, even if the temple would stand today. So why are we reading this section now? And also, the question we asked before still remains. Maybe it's even stronger now. Why must we preserve and put away a supply of ashes for the entire congregation when in reality so few Jews really need it? Furthermore, let's say most Jews are impure. Most Jewish males over the age of bar mitzvah are impure. The halacha is that in such a situation, 
you bring the sacrifice in a state of ritual impurity. The idea of ritual purity is only a, a, a limitation if it's most of the people are ritually pure. But if the situation arose where, for whatever reason it is, most of the Jews are ritually impure, so 51% is impure, then the majority, we follow the majority, and we bring the, 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 we bring the sacrifice in a state of ritual impurity. We say everyone can bring the karba. Everyone can bring the sacrifice. So we would only need the ashes of the red heifer in a state where the majority of the Jews were ritually pure. Because once 51% are impure, so then we don't need it all together. Everyone brings it anyways. So why do we need a, such a large amount in the reserve? Why do we need to preserve a stash for an entire congregation of Jews, for the whole body of Jews? It's never really necessary to have such a large amount. These are the questions that need to be addressed. In order to answer these questions, we have to take a look at what Hasidus has to say on this matter. What is the inner dimension of the Pora what are, what is What are the mystical qualities of this red heifer? What ideas really trigger this necessitation to have the red heifer ashes and how is this rele relevant for us, for me and you today, as we read it, not only in anticipation, not only in, from a historic perspective or a futuristic perspective, but from a reality today, right now, where we stand today as we read it, the Shabbos and Shul, and as we study it today. Many times we discussed the idea that Torah exists in two dimensions. There exists Torah the way it is as we read it and understand it. And then there is Torah the way it exists in the spiritual world, in its spiritual realm. Sometimes people make the mistake and they think that the real Torah is as we read it and understand. It. And the spiritual side reflects that which is here. But the truth is the reverse is true. The true Torah is the way it is in heaven the way it is in the spiritual elements and realities. The way we understand it and the way we incorporate Torah into our lives is only the way we can relate to it, which is the reflection of that, which is reality beyond what we can connect with our five senses. So when we read a, a section of Parah Duma, a section of a red heifer, a whole Torah discussion about this, there has to be something lying behind that which enlightens us into this mitzvah. It gives us perspective into this mitzvah as we're doing it. So let's understand this, for example. Let's understand this in the following, the following manner. God is the source of life, of all life. Because God is life. God is true life. God is the only true life. God's the only true existence. There's no beginning and there's no end. Everything else has a beginning and has an end. So if God is life, the essence of life and the only true life, then what follows is what is the opposite of God? Death. Death is the opposite of God. A dead corpse has no life. Something that has no life whatsoever is an expression of complete darkness and removal from and disconnect from Almighty God. If someone is connected with Hashem, someone is connected with life, someone is alive, 
if someone comes in contact with a dead corpse, with a dead element, that means that someone engaged with something which is polar opposite of Almighty God. Now I have to reconnect. I want to purify myself. I have stained myself. I've cut a cord between me and Almighty God. I've severed a certain element of our relationship because I've engaged with death, with sin, which that which is completely dark and where God is, no, is, is, is not revealed at all. So there's a purification process. What's the purification process entail? The para adumo the red heifer. So what is another way of describing in one word the mitzvah of the red heifer? The mitzvah of the red heifer's idea is, the concept is the concept of tshuva, repentance. It's about wanting to mend, wanting to fix, wanting to connect once again with Almighty God, with life. So as the Rebbe writes in the Kutai Sikhas, volume 16, page 420, the spiritual parallel of ritual impurity that is contracted through contact with a dead body is the principle of your sins separate you from God, a quote from Isaiah. This means that when we lack and you are attached to God, your God, we also lack, God forbid, the Chaim Kulchem Hayoim, you are alive on this day. We say this verse from Deuteronomy, in the big, and when, when we call out the first Aliyah, before the first Aliyah is called out, we say, at the Torah, we say, and you who are attached to Almighty God, Chaim, life, Pulchem Hayoim, you, you are full of life today. Which means, if you're attached to Hashem, then you're full of life. But if you remove that attachment from Hashem, so then the second half of the verse is also taken away, also full. Which that element is that you are alive. Detaching from God is detachment from life, from the source of life. The red heifer, which is synonymous with tshuva repentance, purifies us and reinstates our bond with our origin and source, the living God. So this is the idea behind the red heifer, which will explain one of the ideas that we mentioned earlier, which was where is the red heifer slaughtered? Not on the Temple Mount, not in the temple, but we said it was slaughtered on a mountain, specifically on a mountain off a side next to the Temple Mount. Why the difference? Why from all of the animals that were brought, this is the only one that was slaughtered, not inside the temple. On Yom Kippur, there's a sacrifice. One of the sacrifices brought was the goat. Remember, there was two goats and a lottery was cast. One was brought as a sacrifice and one was shipped to Azazel, but it wasn't slaughtered. That one was pushed off the cliff. This is the only slaughtering ritual process that we go through, not in the temple. Why not? So the Rebbe explained. This is because the idea of the red heifer is to emerge from impurity to purity. In the context of religious experience, this refers to the work of a penitent. That is to say that all of the other offerings represent the worship of righteous people who are not prone to forbidden behavior. Not so the red heifer which is the worship of the penitent and is therefore offered outside of the temple. In other words, what is the red heifer all about? Tshuva. Tshuva is talking about a person who doesn't, right now, doesn't exist in the reality of connection with Hashem. They've been detached and removed from God. They're separated, now wanting to get back. So you have to meet them where they are if, you're, if they're ever to get back. So the process begins where they stand right now off of the Temple Mount, not in a space of holiness. 
Now, some may ask, what about, we read in last week's Parsha, we read about the Korban Chatos. The Korban Chatos was the sin offering. So we just said that this is for the penitent, for the sinner, and therefore it's done outside of the temple. But we have inside the temple a special sacrifice called the Korban Chatos, the sin offering. So how does that go? So the answer is that the sin offering was only brought for inadvertent sins, as I mentioned on Shabbos last week. The red heifer was a response to someone whose level of detachment came from being uh, coming in contact with impurity from the dead, not inadvertently, but it could have even been done on purpose. So the carbon chatos, the sin offering, wasn't something that was for a, 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 a sinner who, was, who, who sinned on purpose. It was only by accident, the inadvertent sinner. So the paraduma is a new reality over here. A reality of bringing someone of a sacrifice for a person who willingly came in contact with death, willingly detached from Hashem. This is something fascinating. The Torah says that they have to begin the process of return where they are right now. Off the Temple Mount, outside of that safe space of Kedusha of holiness. So the question now be, becomes, is tshuva really only for the sinner? This idea of tshuva, generally speaking, if you sin, so you have to do tshuva. If you didn't sin, then you don't have to do tshuva, right? That's generally the way we understand the concept of tshuva. The red heifer is there for someone who came in contact with the dead. If you didn't come in contact with the dead, then you don't need a purification because you're all, already pure. That's the way we generally understand it. What the Talmud says, and we mentioned it a number of times in different classes, that the Baal Teshuva, the one who does Teshuva, stands on a place where even the righteous cannot reach. Which means, which means, there is a certain quality of Teshuva that brings a person to a level that without teshuva, you cannot reach there. What emerges from this idea is that everyone should really be trying to do teshuva. Because if you want to reach the highest, the highest connection with Hashem, the only way you can travel there is through the road of teshuva. The road of righteousness, of purity and righteousness will lead you to a great place but not as great as the road of Tshuva. So we discussed at a previous class how this works. You can't just say, I'm, I'm going to make, I'm going to sin in, so that I will do Tshuva and connect with Hashem because that won't work. But the, at its core, at its core, the basic element of Tshuva is something which can be and should be and must be incorporated by every single person. Jew, regardless of what level they're on. Why? Ain Sadiq. Ain Sadiq Boaretz Ashayasa Toiv Loyachti. I mentioned to you a number of times that there was a saying by Hasidim after Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of our calendar year. Calendar year. It's a day where we are. There is a. Sean, you have to mute because you're, you're it's causing a. There, there's, it's the day where we fast for 25 hours and we're praying and we're in show for 99% of the time. And we're really, we're really uh, connecting with Hashem as best as we possibly could. When Yom Kippur is over, people feel hopefully good about that, their connection with Hashem. They feel a little bit like I'm in a better place 
than I was a day previously. I feel like I've asked of God for forgiveness. I've done my, my, uh, my requesting of Hashem, my confession. I've gotten a lot off of my chest and God, the forgiving God has certainly forgiven me. And now let's go on to Sukkot and celebrate, which is appropriate. But there was a saying by many Hasidim after Yom Kippur, they would say, now that Yom Kippur is over, I feel like we have to start doing Teshuvah. Now we have to start doing Teshuvah. What does that mean? Now we have to start doing Teshuvah. Weren't we just doing Teshuvah for the last 25 hours? Weren't we spending the whole Yom Kippur in a state of trying as best as we could to reconnect with Hashem, to be the best version of me that I possibly can be? What do you mean now that it's over, we have to start doing Teshuvah? And the answer is a very nuanced idea but it's a very powerful idea once you understand it. And that is, teshuva is never ending because if teshuva means to connect with God in a greater way, if there's a road of teshuva, then I recognize that my service of yesterday, the version of me who I was yesterday is no longer in existence. Now I am a new version of me and this new version of me where I stand today that service of yesterday is insufficient for me. Yesterday's service is insufficient for today's version of me. Because I'm a better person, I realized that yesterday's cleaning job wasn't good. If you're a dark pair of slacks and some mud gets on you, you brush it off, nobody notices. A little bit of a lighter color, a little bit people people will notice it more. But if it's a pristine white, beautiful pair of slacks and mud falls on it, even when you wipe away the mud, what's going to happen? There's going to be a stain on your pants or your shirt, your white shirt. It's the most delicate, the most sensitive to stain is white. You do a cleaning job. Good, beautiful. Now what happens if after you send it to the dry cleaners, you get it back and you look at it and you say, fantastic job. It looks, it looks clean to me, great. And then you go and you put on your glasses. And then what do you see? Without my glasses, it was perfectly clean. But with my glasses, there really is a very, 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 no one else is going to notice it. But I see it because I know where it is. Since I know the spot location of the stain, I know what I'm looking for and I know exactly where it is. So now I can see that it actually did leave a mark. That's the idea of post Yom Kippur Tshuva. Because on Yom Kippur, we were given a pair of glasses. We have a new outlook on life because we are refreshed. We're renewed. So the cleaning job that we went through on Yom Kippur was great. But now with my glasses, if I, if I look where I know I need to look, I'll see. It's still something I need to clean up. That's what we have to start doing, tshuva now. That was the message behind this idea. So tshuva is not something reserved only for the penitent. It's not so, something only reserved for the sinner. It's something that the righteous are actually more sensitive to. The more connected you are with God, the better your vision is. The more sensitive you are to unholiness, to things that discolor the white cloth that we all really are, our neshama. And if you think about it, if you really want to go through it, you ask yourself, even if you tried very hard and you were so careful throughout the day, there's sins that are just impossible to... to uh, to, to, to refrain from. Bittel Torah. Wasting time. Can you say you didn't waste one second of time? Not even one second? It's impossible to say that. So if you're a person like me and you, we're not even sensitive to a second. We're not even sensitive to a minute of wasting time. Depending on, how, what, on where you're holding. Some people, an hour is meaningless to them. Two hours, five minutes. Everyone is holding somewhere else. 
But the more sensitive you are to time and its value, one second needs to be, re uh, ne even one second needs to be accounted for. Lashon Hara. Maybe I didn't speak outright Lashon Hara. Fine, I didn't go and go ahead and gossip. But I, I didn't hear Lashon Hara either. I didn't listen to someone else. I didn't backhandedly maybe tr trespass into someone else's business. Basically, it's impossible to be completely careful in this element of Lashon Hara. And if you don't believe me, you can just open up the Chofetz Chaim and read his introduction and read his book. And you'll see how basically you are going to transgress some way or another Lashon Hara, whether you liked it or you didn't like it. That's just the nature of the beast. So there's always, if we're honest, there's always something to do tshuva for the tzaddik recognizes that in his sensitive way, not for major sins, not even for minor sins, not even for something that me and you would call a sin, but to him or, or her on their level, on their level, they view it still as a stain, as a sin that needs to be rectified and corrected. Now we can understand this idea of the red heifer and its importance and its value today. The Torah is teaching us the following lesson. There has to be enough mixture of red heifer ash with water for everyone in the entire congregation. Why? Because this is the starting point of the mitzvah. The starting point of the mitzvah begins here. And then it, as it goes lower and lower, it trickles down. The starting point is that every person needs tshuva. There should always be this idea that every person knows that in the reserve, in the storage, there is a space and a way for me to connect with God in a more proper and better and pristine fashion. The way I am today can be come better. Everyone, not only the sinner, if you came in contact with the dead, if you've actually engaged with the opposite of God, death and sin, and I've severed an element of my connection with Almighty God, then we all recognize we need to have truth then certainly I ask, please, I want to be purified. Sprinkle me with the ashes on the third and the seventh day and let me become once again in a state of ritual purity. But even if you're a woman and even if you're a minor and even if you're old and ill, it doesn't matter who. There has to be enough for everybody because the moment a person recognizes what tshuva is, we realize that we need the tshuva as well. So I need purification. Everyone needs additional purification. Now, in the times of the temple and going, and going further in the times of Mashiach as well, we need to grow in our state of purity. So this answers the question of why, we, the question we asked before, why was it necessary to have a reserve of ash and water mix for everyone in the congregation? And this also answers how this is relevant for us today as we are reading it. Not only, not only for the past, to know what happened in the past, not only to know about our preparation for Pesach, which is very important, how to prepare for Pesach in the proper way to bring the carbon Pesach, but also as we stand today right now as a lesson for the bedrock of our Judaism. This is an essential element of it. Tshuva is a basic element of it. And now we're learning how this is read for the entire congregation, everyone, not because it's a lack of respect for the community. On the contrary, this is the greatest honor for the community to remind everybody Listen, my dear fellow Jews, we're going to read this Shabbos, the section of the red heifer. 
to teach each and every one of us that we all need purification. We all need to become better versions of ourselves. We all need to clean up that which we soiled. What better time to do it than in between Purim and Pesach? When anyways, anyways, the way the mitzvah is incorporated into, into, its, into its observant form, how we observe the mitzvah is in order to bring a carbon, in order to bring a sacrifice, and hopefully we're going to bring the sacrifice this year with Hashem's help when Mashiach come before Pesach, we're going to all bring the sacrifice. So we have to know it from its observance level. But we also have to know it from its spiritual element, from its mystical side, that side that teaches every one of us what God is life, the opposite of God is death. And if you come in contact with death, and we've all contacted either willingly or unwillingly, intentionally, knowingly or unknowingly, we've all, we've all touched that element of death, come in contact with a corpse. And for that, we need purification. And that purification process never really ends. Because the more we grow, the more we connect with Hashem, the better version of me that's, that's living, the more we recognize our vision becomes better and we see deeper and we're able to recognize that which needs still to be purified. Anyone have any questions?